Hello, everyone, and welcome to our cafecito conversation. I hope you have your cafecito in hand or your tecito. Um, really excited to be here. Altamed uh, is proud to be a longtime sponsor of the Los Angeles Latino International Film Festival. And as a director of the Altamed Art Collection, I'm even more excited about our new partnership that explores the connections between Latino film and art. For this year's festival, we celebrate Harry Gamboa Jr., the esteemed Chicano photographer, director, performance artist, writer, and educator, and, and much more. This cafecito brings together Harry and another well-known artist, Gala Porras Kim, for a conversation about performance, social interaction, communication, time and space, and contemporary issues. They worked together in Harry's performance through Virtual Verite, which he directed from 2005 to 17, but I'll let them talk about that later. Um, so first I'd like to introduce Harry, and then I'm gonna introduce Gala, and then we're gonna get into a conversation. So Harry Gamboa Jr. was born in East LA, studied at Cal State Los Angeles, and was part of the renowned Chicano art collective ASCO in the 1970s and 80s. The other artists in the group, Patsy Valdez, Willy Erron, uh, Gronk, Cluyo Nicandro, all met while at Garfield High School. Harry currently teaches photography and media at CalArts and also co-directs the School of Art there. Throughout the festival, we will be showing Harry of short, Harry's short videos, as well as six of his early ASCO photos from 1972 to 76, including some no movies, which he directed, which we'll talk about later. These were staged events for performances resembling stills from movies, fashion shoots, promotional images from music groups, a commentary on the absurd life of Chicanos and Latinos living in Los Angeles at that time, amidst the fantasy and fiction of Hollywood, with of course the dark undertones of that period's socio-political tension and civil, civil unrest. Gala Porras Kim was born in Colombia to a Colombian father and a Korean mother. Her father was a historian and obtained political asylum to come to the US when she was 12 and they moved to Los Angeles. She studied at UCLA and then at CalArts for her master's in fine art and then later returned to UCLA for another master's in Latin American studies after becoming fascinated with the Zapotec language that incorporates whistles among many other experiences and influence. Um, in 2016, she was in a residency in Southern Oaxaca working with a nearby community of indigenous people, speaking a nearly extinct Mexican dialect, Chatino. She later was a fellow at Harvard's Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies and an artist in residence at the Getty Research Institute, studying pre-Columbian objects, archeological fragments, and the restoration, conservation outside of their original context and function. So as you can see, we're gonna have a fascinating conversation today. Both of you, Gala and Harry are incredibly fascinating, complex artists working across a variety of media that include photography, sculpture, film, writing, performance, music, and more. How did you decide where to start, where to take those twists and turns in your career? And can you both talk about the fluid nature of the arts and being cross-disciplinary artists such as yourselves? Listen, Gala, you could have the first cup of coffee. How's that? <laughs> um, okay. I think that in terms of the in shape that the work takes place is kind of really determined by whatever the subject you're working with is. And so I've tried to sort of keep a very flexible endpoint. Um, in what the shape is going to be. And I think that uh, it, it has helped me to be uncomfortable in learning new ways of making work all the time. You know? um, but I think that Harry is actually pro at that. You know, he was my teacher in grad school and then very in like flexibility class, <laughs> as I would think, just to, you know, be open enough to improvise all the time and not get set in one specific shape that things are supposed to be. Harry, tell us about your flexibility classes. Um, <laughs> well, um, you know, I continue to, to teach at CalArts, of course. And one of the things that I do is I quite literally um, have a course called LA Urbanscape in which everyone goes out into the streets and walks in Los Angeles. It explores um, 
this is something I've done my entire life, of course. Um, uh, but uh, I take uh, uh, students anywhere from uh, 10 to 30 students on a, on a walking tour uh, of Los Angeles, but more like on the underbelly of LA and the back alleys and some of the more um, uh, neglected locations, which seem to have the most uh, important kind of historical reference in that quite uh, usually most places in Los Angeles are absolutely artificially uh, designed, uh, installed uh, for multiple purposes. Uh, many uh, spaces in LA are under the jurisdictions of multiple enforcement agencies and private enterprise and, and, and partnerships, which then essentially eliminates public space, um, spaces that have been paid for by the taxpayers. And so every single year I take my students out into the streets, there's less and less that's legally, uh, uh, the legality of being able to tra traverse those spaces uh, become, comes into questions or becomes absolutely prohibited. So, but uh, in terms of flexibility um, uh, at CalArts, uh, actually there was an article that just came out in the, in the hi hi hyperallergic in that uh, CalArts quite often uh, promotes the possibility of failure. And it's through failure that one is then willing to uh, reemerge and experiment and continue. And uh, one, it's very difficult to achieve perfection. And it's, and of course, um, once one does reach that, uh, one has to break that thing and, and start all over again. And so, um, and yeah, and working with Gala, I met Gala when uh, actually I met when she was a, a student with uh, uh, Francesco Cicados uh, at UCLA, and uh, and we had a conversation and. Um, and I think it was that day you mentioned that maybe CalArts would be a place, but uh, it it was always about um, uh, being being open to spontaneity, being open to uh, current events. Um, uh, LA, of course, is made up of maybe a thousand microclimates, so one might have to um, endure the cold, the heat, the smog, uh, the radiation, the poison, uh, the violence, uh, the the love fest. Um, and pick up the gold nuggets along the way while avoiding the treacherous uh, potholes. And so, um, uh, and, and while doing that, of course, um, we learn how to dance. And so in a way we become almost like urban um, uh, ballerinas um, and also at the same time avoid uh, the violence that uh, might occur uh, by, by numerous uh, 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 antagonists uh, by being quite agile and um, and resilient, is that something like that goal? Yeah, I think plus you definitely need to learn agility to be flexible, and you're like pro. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, um, uh, uh, I, I, maybe a little bit about working with Gala. So, uh, uh, I, I of course in the 1960s I met um, the OSCO members. Um, Actually, I, I, I was very interested in locating artists that could uh, participate in uh, helping me to illustrate um, the publication called Regeneración, which was based on uh, uh, the publication that was put out by the uh, 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 famous uh, Mexican anarchist, uh, Ricardo Flores Magón. And so it was uh, uh, reborn in the 1960s during the Chicano movement. And I was uh, very much involved in, in uh, some of the very dynamic events of that period and got a chance to meet people that um, had actually lived through the Mexican Revolution or through World War I or World War II and other kinds of uh, protest movements. And uh, it was quite an education to be mentored by some of these people, but also people who had, um, had, had been inventors and, and scientists and poets and people who had been present in some important uh, moments. And, and I myself was able to meet uh, very, um, I guess, some historical figures such as Bobby Kennedy, Oscar Zeta Costa, uh, Bert Corona, a handful of other people, actors, of course, uh, in Los Angeles. And, um, and so there was always this awareness that um, uh, there was something uh, about the screen. Now, here we are on the screen today, but back then it was television. That, um, uh, and in television was very particular as to who could appear on the screen. But I was able to, at a very early age, uh, be able to peer behind the screen and recognize that, um, that these were actual human beings uh, that were then transported and becoming uh, visual um, images and icons. And uh, very early on, the idea uh, occurred to me that it would be very uh, uh, interesting and advantageous 
to transform my friends and people who I respect into visual icons and, um, and to have important role in, uh, in, in contributing to the visual dialogue, the performance dialogue. Uh, and so um, when I had invited uh, the, the original uh, OSCO members to join together with me to work on this publication, um, which is uh, Grant Patsy, Willie Heron, and Umberto Sandoval, um, it became very obvious that as a group, we could perform uh, for 35 millimeter photography. I found myself uh, becoming very interested. I'm self-taught, so, uh, but being fortunate enough to be in Los Angeles, I was able to uh, um, uh, come across some, some very uh, specific photographic equipment. I, I used uh, originally a Minolta camera when they first uh, joined forces with Leica to make particular lenses. I was also uh, uh, able to uh, secure a steady flow of um, a very restricted kind of a film stock, which was called Ektachrome 400 uh, Professional, which was used basically by the major film studios, MGM, Paramount, uh, you name it, Universal. And, uh, and of course the concept was, was that um, when taking photographs, uh, uh, I would be using the same film stock Films themselves, although they refer to it as, as uh, motion pictures, nothing ever really moves. It's a sequence of still images. And whenever I saw a film, I would always leave just with one image in my mind of what that film was all about. And I felt that it would be probably um, much more efficient to simply take the photograph of the image that you would remember. And, uh, and that's actually what's happened. And so uh, the idea was to, um, how do you bypass uh, the gatekeepers in Hollywood who continue to keep uh, Latinos, uh, Chicanos in particular, um, from being present as uh, in, in sort of high profile positions. Um, and actually the idea of, um, of eliminating the possibility of sharing and the wealth generated by the film industry. Um, I felt that uh, I could spend my entire life trying to make a single film, or I could spend my life making thousands and thousands of memorable images, which is what, um, uh, uh, came to be. And so again, uh, going back, coming closer to the moment, um, I've always been very tuned in to uh, uh, meeting people, but there's some people who just sort of have a natural presence and um, uh, I would have to say star quality. So for instance, when I'm at Gala, I mean, it was immediately, I was immediately taken that, uh, you know, I needed to photograph her, but it, it was also the idea of engaging an ongoing dialogue and and, and, uh, and I would have to say about a virtual verite, um, and then and Gala, you heard this before, but I would always claim that my performance troupe probably had the highest IQ in the world. <laughs> group. Uh, many of those people went on to become uh, very important scholars, people that would generate, people that would invent things, people that are, they're all makers, they're all doers, and all intellectuals. And, uh, and the idea was to have everyone be introduced to each other and, uh, and make it very dynamic and uh, and contribute. And so, um, uh, so virtual verite uh, came uh, in 2005, and uh, and that dealt with a different era. It had to deal with the post 9/11 um, uh, declaration that uh, maybe um, uh, we're dealing with a, a concept uh, that's in decline, that's in particular motion that in some way or another has to be the, the, the more important elements of culture need to be uh, rescued, retrieved, or reinterpreted. Uh, and also the idea uh, of, uh, and Gala, I, I'll just bump into this also, uh, sort of the notions of, uh, of maybe some of the ancient Mexican notions, for instance, of Napatla being in between, um, of, um, of being between life and death. Um, I kind of have the, benefit of having been born on Dia de los Muertos and uh, also had a grandfather who scribbled on the back of my birth certificate, La Vida No Vale Nada, which was like a hall pass uh, to get through life um, without a care in the world. And wow. what a uh, way to start life. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so uh, the, 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 the idea is that um, if, uh, if you are uh, both alive and dead, uh, there's no sense for fear. And, uh, and fear uh, is what will, will restrain people. And one has to go past fear uh, in order to explore. And, and again, you mentioned that I grew up in East LA, but I, I have literally been present uh, in some of the major uh, iconoclastic events that took place in East LA where um, 
police uh, used uh, live firepower on, uh, on, uh, on groups of Chicanos or individuals. I was at the receiving end. Fortunately, I was never uh, hit, but I was present when many of my friends were hit, killed, or harmed, along with sort of the collective uh, 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 elimination of my friends during the Vietnam War based on the antipathy by Richard Nixon, uh, who uh, specifically uh, did not like Mexican Americans and Mexicans. He was uh, responsible for establishing uh, Operation Wetback in the 50s. And, uh, and basically, uh, I've told everyone, one of the reasons for that was, was that he was so uncool. He would never be cool. He was, uh, he was basically uh, uh, someone who uh, pretended to be and, uh, and always wanted to be cool. And I don't know if you know this, but he would oftentimes play piano chopsticks with Frank Sinatra Jr. at Stevens Steakhouse in East LA. And so- um, Oh my goodness. And so, and so uh, uh, this was his attempt to be cool, but uh, you know, even at that, he started at the second rate level and uh, only went downhill. And, uh, and unfortunately he's gone, but he, said, he, unleashed, he unleashed, as we know, a wave of hatred uh, and mm -hmm. the allowance for people to pursue particular uh, negative uh, means. Um, this, of course, could only be met by uh, countering that with absolute optimism, uh, forceful creativity, uh, freedom, and the ability to laugh. And, uh, yeah. and, and when you laugh, um, and when you laugh as you're being beaten, it, uh, it disconnects with the you know, overall effect uh, that your tormentors are expecting uh, to receive from you. And actually meant much of OSCO and actually much of um, uh, a virtual verite and even my current troupe, it's really all about the idea of negating participation as a victim. Um, one, um, one must agree to be a victim in order to be a victim. And so uh, I disagree. And, uh, and we pursue strength and excellence. And, uh, and again, I just applaud Gala and I applaud all, all the former members of uh, virtual verite. Um, and uh, I may not go as far as doing that for Osco, but I may <laughs> do that for, for, for uh, Virtual Verite and some of my current groups. But of course, we've all tried so hard uh, to really move forward and affect the positivity on young people and in society um, and to give people really something to talk about uh, rather than the negative stereotypes that are generated by conglomerates, uh, governments, you name it. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about past and present, right? I mean, we, we keep going back and, you know, you talk about the, the really difficult life and nature and politics in the 60s. And we talk about the present. And of course, when, you know, you were very much in the moment at that time. Right. Um, and, but we still go back to that, that past today. And Gala, with, with your work, you know, you, you very much go back to the past. Um, you go back to the past in, in terms of uh, anthropology and archaeology and past cultures and languages and, and um, archaeological fragments. Um, let's, let's talk about this anthropological approach. Um, can, can you tell me, Gala, a little bit about that and then how you see this, this, this connection between modern and ancient cultures and, and, and you know, between what's going on, um, creating art that's that's of the moment, but then also looking back to the past. I think like just listening to what Harry just said really resonates with the way that I, I think about the work uh, in terms of representation and how those, you know, ancient cultures are represented institutions today. And so in a sense, when I see when I uh, saw them for the first time or I learned about antiquities, it was in this very specific frame of work that was like, let's just keep it in the past. It's not necessarily like around anymore or here is some sort of speculative interpretation that sounds very factual. And so when you present that to an audience, it feels like it's the only sort of history that there might be. And so, you know, thinking through ideas of like, what else could it have been that is not so like, specific no I think that um, when you uh, with the work and I and following what Harry was talking about is just seeing that there's something else that is actually way more interesting than just how it's actually framed by whoever is framing no and 
So many of the works is actually just uh, focusing on antiquities that uh, we're never supposed to stop doing something back in the day, no? So like perpetual function objects, which is a small category of antiquities, but still exist, no? Like somebody at some point believed that this thing was never gonna stop doing something. And Can so you what, give us an example, Gala? Like pillow that you go to the afterlife with is supposed to be pillow forever, no? And so once it becomes a historical object in a museum, what happens to this very uncomfortable dead person who doesn't have a pillow anymore, no? And wow. so just thinking about like, okay, you know, why should we think that somebody back in the day's point of view or idea of what infinity was for them is less important than what we think in terms of framing historical objects, no? And, and that's more than just the object that goes to these, these, these ancient cultures and beliefs. Of course, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I was just looking at the, you know, ancient Egyptians, they plan so well for their afterlife and I don't have, I have no idea what happens after you die. And so why wouldn't I just be like, well, they actually knew what they wanted for there. So why would I even try to say it's wrong? You know? And so it's just giving, giving other people, you know, agency to determine whatever the representation is, comes down to that, no? Whether they're alive now or back in the day, it's still similar, similar issues, no? So I think that um, in terms of uh, what Harry was talking about, you know, like how, how things get represented in like mass media or like general culture, like who is representing those things? Um, and I think with antiquities is sometimes is very clear that this is not, the way, like even when you go to institutions now and just read the labels, you know, that the, the interpretation is like ancient people wanted this to happen in the afterlife. I'm like, okay, you literally already know what they wanted, no? And so um, it's a mismatch. But I really appreciate, you know, uh, being able to have met Harry so young because he definitely uh, influenced so much of the way that I... Um, approach these very sad things in the world you know these are like really terrible moments but in a way it's just like it's just been presented to me as that they don't have to be this way and so just suspending what gets put on top of your face you know on your you know yeah how you how you learn things and how there can be an alternative way of even seeing the world no? um yeah and this transformative process really is the creative process of, of all artists, right? I mean, you, you're, you're giving new life and transforming um, stories and, and I think that, that life was already there. You know, it's not a new life. It's us old life, actually, you know, is the, or, is the original life. And then it just, the new life is something that has been like reframed as, and so it was just sort of re returning to like acknowledging that there's something else before and maybe trying to shift the focus from this, you know, current day interpretation of what something might be into what, you know, what it actually is, no? So, so Gala, you had two very interesting examples of this uh, transformation, reformation, rebirth, um, whatever we can call it. You know, one is the, the record that you did, uh, the LP with the whistling, if you want to talk about that. And then the other was uh, the work you did in Oaxaca to, to, to transform uh, that language into signs and function? I think in a way it's not doing so much work, you know, those things already existed. It's just framing them. You know, I, you know, people think that I, I don't feel like a general author per se is more like, oh, I see that this thing is already here and I'm just framing it. No. Can, like can you tell our audience a little bit about those two examples? Yeah. So for example, the, this record that you're talking about is one work that I did right after I finished grad school, which was to make a LP record of translated Zapotec language into its whistled form because you know, in antiquity and even current day, some of the spoken language can be translated into whistles because it's a tonal language. So it, it's already attached to uh, sound. Um, and I made a record. So I spent two years like learning Zapotec and trying to figure out if I could whistle it myself, but it was not possible. So I ended up using technology or something. But in a sense, you know, those things already existed. Like the language was already there, people are already doing, but it's just being like, how do you take an every, uh, it's just seeing what, what are the things that has framed this thing that is in the world that makes you not even see it anymore, no? 
And so that's kind of what there was. And then the, the, I think the other one that you're mentioning was that I uh, went to do a public uh, project in, um, in Oaxaca where, but again, that, you know, it, where I made these uh, signs of all the public spaces in this town um, in uh, Chatino with a translation that was uh, from the Chatino, not to Spanish, not the other way around. Cause you know, most things are like translated from the Spanish into something else, but the sentence structure is different in indigenous language. And so the Spanish underneath is just derived from whatever the, the, the Chatino word was. For example, there's uh, the word for park is not park. It, parque is a um, place where people play. And so in a way it's just, how, who uh, the the rearranging of uh, which uh, sign gets prioritized, you know, because um, so just switching it and you know the 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 content of that work actually came from like the elder ladies of that town. So they we gathered and then there was a government meeting where they uh, uh, decided who was going to be the one to decide how those words were written because they had not been written down. It's a tonal oral tradition. And so they decided that these uh, uh, educator ladies who um, didn't know uh, that much Spanish. And so they were actually the, the repository of indigenous knowledge because they had not been, you know, furthest removed from uh, being um, um, infiltrated by Spanish and literacy. You know? Yeah. So you you once I, I want to talk a little bit about methodology for a minute. Um, you you once mentioned Gala about the academic nature of your artistic practice, and and both of you are really steeped into academia. <laughs> um, you 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 once said that you don't write a paper at the end of your research; you make something. Okay. Yeah. Um, so so let's let's talk about not only methodology, but that balance between spontaneity that you both love and is so important, and then and then research. And you know, Harry, you're an educator, mm -hmm. right? You 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 teach methodology. Um, so can you both talk about it across um, media and professions? I think at least in my personal life, it has been so much about institutional flair. You know, everybody has the capacity to research and like really dedicate a lot of time into what they do. But in terms of like how to actually make it career wise, you have to have these like very specific signs that are like, well, now the same thought that you had before is framed in this category and now we can listen to it. And so in a sense, it's also, I actually learned this very early from Harry also, cause he has always encouraged me to keep going to school forever. I remember these meetings that we had mm -hmm. when I was like 23, when he was like, okay, let me know when you're getting your PhD, like every single time. And so to, to understand how those symbols actually function in day-to-day -day career is very important for early on to just be like, well, we live as artists in our job is to see what symbols are and how they get valued in you know, our day-to-day -day world. And if people value this specific institution, then what is it about it versus any other type of institution that we might have like community or you know, um, self-drive or, some other thing like that and but but now that I'm actually like teaching on the other side and being more involved I feel like the biggest takeaway has also been to like talk to young people back where it's like oh to make an artwork versus to frame you know you you can make an artwork but to me the the biggest sort of um what is the word uh when you get when I feel the most useful is when you actually are forming young people's brains. No, you're like, well, that idea was not there. And then you're going to find your way and to just keep pushing people to just like multiply that thought is uh, yeah. really exciting. I'm sure you feel that Harry. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I sometimes think about my introduction to um, academia was, um, you know, my background of course was not uh, steeped in academia, but, um, I think it was the, the day, the first day I handed something to an academician and they declared it to be sort of the leading uh, 
material for their primary research. And so, uh, uh, again, finding something that could be handed to someone that would be reinterpreted uh, or making something that had not previously existed that then served a different purpose in a different mm -hmm. realm. And uh, which then, of course, has been a, a big role of mine has been to kind of deflect um, the direction, play tricks on people, do different things. I think when I first encountered uh, the internet, I made uh, two uh, very complex um, uh, internet sites uh, involving lots of literature, imagery, and I would tell all these um, scholars all about it, and they started writing about uh, the material that was in there, and then I would alter the material, and then ultimately I deleted all of it. None of it exists anymore, which then um, either um, made falsified their footnotes or completely defrauded <laughs> everyone, and uh, so which then was sort of one of the early uh, approaches as to what's common behavior now. And so, uh, um, okay, so you have a very different view of uh, academia, very different yeah, relationship. But, uh, but, but uh, again, the, uh, uh, I think what one of the things that Gal has been pointing at is also uh, the, the, the power structure of who's able to define what is and what isn't. Exactly. And, uh, and also, uh, by doing so, uh, who can be neglected and who can be omitted mm -hmm. uh, and who's not included in the dialogue. So, Gala, you mentioned about the whistling. Well, in my whole life, I've always whistled to everyone. Um, you know, my. I remember my, you telling me that. Each of my each of my children, all of my friends, all have a separate whistle. Like exactly. I grew up in East LA, where everyone whistled. But um, uh, the idea is that, uh, uh, and then I live uh, I live in the West Side, where people still speak Zapotec, and I hear it all the time. And so um, uh, 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 this idea of, of negating uh, sort of the actual indigenous languages here, where it's not even included. On, uh, on any of the, of the paperwork that's distributed here. Uh, these are people that have been here for you know, more than 40,000 years and, uh, and they don't rate uh, to be mentioned or whatever. And, uh, and of course, uh, again, we just see the way things are, are framed as whose lives value the most. Um, and Gala, I do feel sorry for those who have uh, passed and are uncomfortable without their pillow, but we have so many of the living who are very uncomfortable and have never seen a pillow. And yeah. so uh, this thing that, uh, 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 you know, and at the same time, living in Southern California, you're, you're, you're just immersed in, in, uh, in some sort, of, so, sort of this extreme wealth. I'm not gonna mention where you're located right now, Gala, but uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, you have sort of the extreme ends of the spectrum uh, of, uh, of, the, of the wealth uh, distribution disparity. Uh, and, uh, and it's usually slanted in both different ends. Uh, and here it might even be equally weighed. You might have equally as many uh, billionaires as you do poor people in Southern California, which then adds to some kind of schizophrenic experience. Um, uh, um, you know, I've, I've had fun sometimes being on the 405 freeway going over the Mulholland Drive when I get stuck in traffic and I'm able to heckle uh, billionaires uh, as I continue on the fast lane. And, and they're stuck in traffic. And, and of course, that's only a, a symbolic moment because of course, uh, the reality is they can go 200 miles an hour and I'm on my way to work. And so, uh, um, uh, but these kind of, kind of ephemeral moments uh, in which all of it is ephemeral, uh, in particular at this moment when we're probably closest to being at a nuclear war than even when I was a child, when they were exploding thousands of nuclear bombs every day, uh, uh, polluting the entire environment, uh, uh, there, there's something to be said about uh, uh, understanding that time and space are real and that they are fluid and that it's something that uh, is capable of being transformed uh, primarily through our perception. So, so let's, let's go back to this notion of lack of representation and imbalance in the power structure because this, this goes back all the way to your your early ASCO days and the no movies and, and your your very iconic Chicano cinema photo which which we're going to show as part of the, the festival right and and that was really highlighting this this imbalance which we're still talking about today we're talking about the, the lack of representation for indigenous um, we're talking about the lack of respect for for the, the the artifacts, right? Those those living artifacts and and how they're taken out of their context. Um, what 
what advice would you give to, to those that are listening, those that are in the industry, those that are artists of, of all different types and, and how, you know, if, if we recognize that this imbalance is this, this lack of representation still exists and it's not really getting better, what advice would you give them how, how to do something about it, how to talk about it, how to, to make a difference, to express what you might wanna do? I think in a way is just making your own space. You know, when I actually finished grad school, I had these questions of like, okay, well, I don't necessarily know so many artists that I can like see what path they took. And so then in a way it was like, well, if it's not there in the existing structure, then you just have to make your own. You know, it's like, why should I look to try and like work with a different gallery when I can just make my own and just work with the people who also not looking for another gallery. And I think in a way it's just managing FOMO that already exists to just be like, well, you can just make a space anywhere you're at with the skills you have. And so I think a lot of that is just having the flexibility to not be stuck, you know, following uh, like, I when I think about representation is already in existing spaces, you know? And so representation where, you know, like in the specific art industry or film industry or something, but in a way, you know, like, Harry also just did that himself. He was like, well, whatever, I'm still gonna make this work anyway, you know? Um, I, I, I think there's something also, um, um, for instance, um, both Gala and I are probably, um, uh, we were both on the cover of Art Forum. Um, we are always in the media. We're always present. We're uh, present in name and facial recognition and our work is represented. We're also uh, represented in the uh, scholarly journals and sort of um, anecdotal stories. Uh, the idea is to, uh, it's important for an artist to engage with the media and to generate your own media uh, and also to, to represent yourself, but to represent your ideas. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, the thing is with uh, the misrepresentation is that there's so many people willing to portray a false identity uh, in exchange for a paycheck. And so, uh, and, uh, and again, the, the initial uh, element of misrepresentation. And here I will talk a little bit about the way Chicanos are misrepresented, particularly and disparaged uh, constantly and um, in films going all the way back, um, mm -hmm. you will find people who are willing to portray a Chicano in a disparaged mode and get paid for it and, and have no re and have actually no relationship to Mexican Americans whatsoever. And so the idea is that uh, the Mexican plays a particular role in the history of the United States in that it's, uh, uh, and it's actually such an essential role in eliminating uh, uh, um, uh, knowledge, uh, as we know all across the country, governors are burning books, uh, banning, uh, banning the children from learning, uh, but not actually banning the weapons that can harm the children at the same time. Um, um, the idea that, uh, 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 you know, how did Mexican Americans uh, become in the first place? And uh, Mexican Americans have only been around for less than, uh, 200 years, and that occurred at the end of the Mexican-American War. And, uh, and from that point on, it's all been nothing but a negative stereotypical publicity campaign that continues forward, which is very effective. Uh, so it, it's a, it has sort of a historical context uh, to then overcome. One cannot be engaged in such a confrontational approach because you'll deplete your energies. One has to basically uh, emerge with ideas and information that actually enlightens everyone um, internationally, actually. So mm -hmm. for instance, uh, I know that Gala's travel all around the world. I've uh, done performance works uh, with people uh, in uh, Antwerp, in Stockholm, Berlin, Mexico City, uh, Paris, um, and Marseille, um, have people do things that explore their own space in a way that um, um, I introduced sort of a Chicano uh, attitude in some of these places. And, and, uh, and they've, of course, every place has their own history, but it's the idea of um, what happens when you use the, the human body as the medium. And of course, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and everything that's related to the human experience, uh, the objects that are left behind. Uh, Osco 
early on, we would use um, various props that were generally built by um, uh, Gronk, Willie, and Patsy. And whenever we did something, we would leave the artifacts behind. And so whoever uh, found something would either wear it. And I, I know that some of the objects we made, uh, uh, particularly there's an image that occurs here and there of a camera, it says Osco on it, it ultimately became a pinata and was smashed to smithereens. Uh, we someone filled it with candy. And so um, uh, this idea of how sort of a, uh, the counter use and, and making things uh, perpetually useful uh, again, uh, uh, but you know, we are all only here for a very specific time, but how do we introduce something that affects the trajectory of thought and behavior? And actually, I think ultimately the idea of uh, generating a respect for people and, uh, and for those who are here and for those who are not here and for those who are yet to be here. Yeah, I love that again, going back and, and forth with time. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I love it when you said that using the human body as a medium, which which sort of brings us to the notion of film, right? And we're all here because of a film festival, right. a very important film festival. So let's let's talk a little bit about cinematography. Right. Um, the word comes from the ancient Greek words kinema, which is movement, and graphion, which is writing. Right? something that both of you are, are involved with. Um, can you both talk a little bit about um, perhaps how you view cinematography? Do you, do you see a connection to your work in some way to cinematography? Gala? Um, I don't really think about film too hard, but um, uh, I have dabbled only when Harry has invited me <laughs> to do. And I think that in a way uh, working with, when uh, we were taking these pictures when I was in school and after, it really helped me to become loose and more embodied, I think, because you get stuck. I think that when I'm working in the studio, it's just like get stuck in your mind and not know that there's actually a world around it. No, so it's like, okay, well, there's a body and then you're rolling around and then you have to be aware of how your own image exists in the world too. And I think that maybe maybe if I can think of the, um, the, the closest way of, I'm thinking of cinema and representation is I guess in the way that you have to kind of, um, pre I think about it in relationship to my own life, not so much my work and how you kind of have to, it feels like writing a documentary or something like doing, I'm, I'm not a very public person generally if I had a choice, but I think that thinking about cinema and representation is like, well, if I have to show my face in public, how would it be? We're in a camera, we have to like be artist looking or not, or what does it mean to be an artist shape or teacher shape or whatever shape, no? Um, so mostly in relationship to that, but in terms of the, the work itself, I don't know yet how to think about that. So, so that's really interesting. That's like when you have an opening night in your gallery, right? You, you have to be you, like, I am have, artist shape. So you have the artist look like, I don't know. <laughs> Well, um, I, I'd have to say that, uh, uh, you know, cinematography played a, a major role in my life and continues to, to play a role. It's, uh, I don't know, I, I kind of see life as a sort of, a, in its grand, grandeur status in a way, everything seems to be very momentous. And, um, and uh, I'm always thinking about selecting what will be uh, photographed, for instance, or what will be remembered. I'm a writer also, so it's this idea of, generating a narrative uh, through a series of works. Um, and I look at people as though they're, as though they are, have star quality also. And so the idea is like, how do you then generate uh, an image? And, and as I mentioned, the, the no movies were designed to specifically in a way um, counter at the same time, mimic uh, the, the cinematic norms uh, to achieve sort of the sense of uh, visual power. And prominent. Hey, Harry, sorry to interrupt. Can you just give a, a really brief description of the No movies for our audience? Yeah, so so the the No movie um, 
uh, and again, this was, uh, I'd have to say early on, uh, again, being very young at the time, uh, 50 years ago, um, uh, very playful. I'm still playful, but I'm not very young. But uh, the idea was that uh, um, people would ask us questions, what are we doing? And so the idea was, uh, was also the notion that they weren't about to give us very much um, uh, uh, ink on the page. So it was always the idea of uh, truncating and, and, and creating new uh, uh, definitions, new words. I've, I've created quite a number of words that are come, come into the American uh, uh, lexicon. Uh, but one of them, of course, was a no movie. And the idea was that uh, uh, it would be an image that would imply there was a preceding and succeeding images uh, to follow as though it would be a single frame extracted from a real film, uh, except it's unreal, but all film is unreal. And so, uh, uh, but yet to make the unreal so real that you would believe it actually occurred. And so, uh, uh, and one of this had to do also with the process of photographing in the streets of East Los Angeles during that era it was extremely dangerous. Uh, there had been sort of essentially somewhat of a sort of localized martial law of allowing Chicanos to play at night. Uh, you would be uh, harmed by the police. Uh, and so, um, so I learned how to, uh, and, and participated uh, with in, in projects where things actually that, that I did photograph only existed for probably less than a minute. Actually, probably almost all the, the well-known images from the Oslo era uh, were present in real life uh, for less than a minute. Uh, so being taped to the wall, uh, taking a walk down Whittier Boulevard, uh, uh, having a, a decoy gang war victim, uh, very limited time span on site, um, uh, leaving everything behind uh, simply to, to catch the image, uh, um, uh, and then to transform it into uh, giving it, uh, his, to historify it before it actually had become history. And so that would become sort of a very, uh, again, this idea of manipulating uh, the thought, the purpose, the meaning and the intention and the timeline for all of this. And this would be dependent on other people whose job is actually to create such timelines. Um, and, and, and this has caused great consternation, confusion for people to have, who have a very strict timeline. Uh, but um, uh, uh, I'd have to say that uh, the, the idea of cinematography in, in some way is very mathematical, sort of uh, uh, in, uh, in its own way. It's very uh, intuitively mathematical in terms of placement, uh, depth of perception, uh, placement, what's in focus, what's not in focus. Uh, you know, I can shoot um, and actually I have a series in which I photograph men. It's called Chicano Male Unbonded in which I, I take one photograph of a, of a male, but I normally shoot 200 photographs of the male in the same position, tell them to freeze. And I select one, but every single frame has a different facial expression. We don't notice that we're moving in, in microseconds. And, uh, and so it's always about the selection, the curation of the particular image that's gonna have the, the primary impact uh, or the desired impact, uh, 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 which then contributes uh, continuously uh, uh, in, in relation to the other photographs I've taken, but also within the, the time frame of when they were taken. So there's a, there's sort of a very interesting photograph that, uh, that Gala is, is, appears in. It's called um, uh, six, uh, uh, six to Tangle, in which everyone is uh, tied up at the ankles, except the rope isn't tied to anything. And everyone's kind of in this frozen moment of grief and, and, uh, and awe. And uh, as though they're seeing some disaster um, that's before them. And I had a, did a whole series of these moments where everyone looks beautiful. They look like, uh, you know, movie stars, but they're in such uh, terror at the moment, but at the same time being drawn in awe to the, the disaster that's unfolding. Um, but again, it's the future. And the future, of course, is what's now. And, uh, and we see it all. We see it all the time, this kind of absurd, uh, this absurd uh, understanding where we're at presently in the United States, which none of it really makes any sense at all. And so the idea that it's, it's come to fruition, um, what colonists were all about, and that is to destroy. And, uh, and of course, those that are here, our role is to live. And so, um, and, and I'd have to say that Gala's work, pre, it's all about predating the colonizers and how to facilitate and persist past colonizers 
and mine is how do you coexist and supersede the colonizer? Mm -hmm. Any response to the colonizers, Ghana? I just, <laughs> no, I mean, I think just listening to Harry's like, he already just said it just right. You know, I think in a sense, it's even more clear than I could think through it. So um, I, I, I think another thing that's really kind of really important. So, um, and again, it's just because we're, where we're at today. So, you know, earlier in the week, we have this tragic event with all the children. Um, however, while everyone's shedding tears, um, children are still put in cages. Um, people have disrespect for children. Um, all throughout the country, people are eliminating uh, uh, what could actually contribute to their education. Uh, but the media too uh, contributes to uh, a, a, a sort of an educational dysfunction uh, the idea it's important to really have children um, grow into very meaningful adults, as it were. Uh, and so, and how do we do this? We, we, we need to make sure that everyone understands uh, human value. And human value is that uh, uh, we must respect. And, uh, and at the same time, part of it is, uh, and it's a big part of it, is to have fun, fun living, enjoy, enjoy living and make sure that those that would um, prevent us from enjoying, um, they obviously have some, some conflict that uh, make everyone else want to not laugh and not be happy. And so, uh, uh, and of course that falls into the systems that are in place at this moment. And so, so how do we counter that? Um, again, I'm 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 an artist. I'm not a politician. I'm not. I have no power at all. The idea is to introduce new images and new ideas that alter um, the uh, to to provide you with an opportunity to look at something that could be a, could be a different way of looking at the world. Well, I disagree that you have no power at all because I believe that artists have a tremendous power, and they bring an insight into our current society and issues that, that no one else can. And that's why artists are so valuable to our society. Um, you know, I'm glad you're not a politician, yeah. <laughs> but I, I do think you have a power. And, um, you know, this is the power of art and the power of cinema is, is you know, what, what both of you do and what everyone does as artists is, is, you know, taking these issues, whether they're issues about lack of Latino representation in cinema, or issues about indigenous languages or um, uh, artifacts being taken from where they were supposed to have been, you know, belong to. Um, and, and you bring these to the public in, in the most beautiful, creative, powerful way. Um, but but I, do, I do wanna go back to this notion of unreal and real. Um, and, you know, thank you, Harry, for reminding us about all the difficulties that are still in our society today and that seem unreal. You know, it, it seems unreal when we think about what's happening uh, in schools and at the border, yet they're real. Um, and art is always a, a bit of both, right? It's a bit of the real, it's a bit of the unreal, much like cinema. Um, can, can you both talk about a little bit your your consciousness about the unreal and the real and and how you how you balance that consciously or unconsciously gala i mean even just thinking about the news and how that shooting was put in the media i think it there was an event and how the media frames it after helps or allows for people to just become numb to the fact that this is a catastrophic moment. And so in a sense to think that our job is to kind of frame different parts of like the world, how, how to do that, place this like sort of, to have a position, even though it seems like there's no position, it's kind of, um, I mean, it feels like uh, our job is kind of to understand the, what is the steps that it takes to, that media is taking to like frame things? What words are they using? If they use this word or this word, what does it change? 
because there's never going to be a way to actually understand a past event or a, a situation that a, a specific person is going through. We can only get close to it, but how, from what angle you're coming from is always going to be different. And I think that that's the unreal quality of representation that it's like, well, you can't never actually have the thing or you can, how do you approximate it or from which point of view, because there's infinite ways to do that, no? Gala, can you talk a little bit about, I'm sorry, I heard before you start, just uh, you, 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 your, some of your work involves um, reproductions and, and the placement of those reproductions. Can, can you just talk a little bit about that? I mean, even within my drawings, they all come from photographs. And so in a sense, when you see these sort of, uh, it's like objects in a shelf and they feel like they're existing in the same space, but they were all photographed at different times, all photographed from different angles. So when you remove sort of the, the, the kind of, they have a shelf, which is the thing that stabilizes them to pretend like they exist in the same picture frame, but in reality, when you look closely, they're all feel imbalanced because they all are, you know, photographed from above, from in front, from the side, but it's hard to see unless because there's something else in front, you know, in the final sort of treatment and presentation that makes you not really be able to pay attention to that. And so I think it's just looking closer because eventually, you know, now that you like reveal the, you know, the sort of director's cut of how the image is made, then you can actually never unsee those uh, perspective changes, no? Right, thank you. Harry? Well, you know, the real and the unreal, I mean, uh, somewhere in between is surreality. So it's all about what's surreal. And we're kind of living in an age that's, fairly surreal. It's very difficult to um, uh, uh, verify what is real. It's actually even what's, I guess, the more frightening thing, it's very difficult to verify what is unreal and puts us at a disadvantage of trying to, uh, it's the reason we have five senses. Uh, the five senses are really designed to verify from all particular available data uh, what is real. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, as a human being, we have sort of a, a limited access to the real world and we have to invent a good portion of it. For instance, even the experience of film, um, you know, we all witness a film, but we've never seen anything actually move. But everyone has a favorite movie and the favorite action movie, but there is no action. There is none. No one's ever gonna see any action. And on the, on the electronic screen, the images never actually exist at all. And so um, we all agree that we're experiencing something, but it's not there. And so this, uh, uh, this uh, kind of this uh, uh, sort of default that we're all in agreement, uh, but we're all in agreement that we're completely lost uh, without, a, without understanding that we're completely lost in this realm of information where ultimately those that uh, are in control of delivering the information uh, can manipulate uh, uh, very large populations, um, 8 billion people at a time. Mm -hmm. And as an artist, uh, we, um, we present things. And, and for instance, if you put something on the wall, you have to go and see it on the wall. So it's a it's a one-to-one -one experience. Uh, but in, when you do things uh, out in the streets, like I do, uh, there might be one or two people that will have experienced it either as a performer or from a bystander, but it's only through my lens that I'm able to capture that particular moment that I'm specifically looking for to then share. And, uh, and, in and when I was using film, well, even I was denied that, it wouldn't actually occur until actually it was processed. And now with the digital, it's somewhat, uh, somewhat instantaneous, but it, uh, once again, it does get altered and shifted. And so, um, and by the time it's presented to you, it's undergone many steps, which, which makes all of it unreal. Uh, all of it to create, uh, uh, um, a real effect, so the effect is real, mm -hmm. and uh, and so that's uh, and and that actually is what contributes to action, or a change of attitude, or or uh, or an additional uh, element of of knowledge, uh, which then gets included into the international dialogue, and so um, again, um, again, I feel that um, uh, uh, you know my role, pretty much since the beginning, has been to contribute images 
that might in some way or another add to the overall definition of what it means to be Chicano, but also what it means to be human being in 20th and 21st century, um, with the understanding that um, almost all my photographs are populated by people, um, um, and but usually with people who they themselves will uh, forever be followed and documented themselves, because as I mentioned before, these are all people that are doing and making things and, and it contributes and, and it kind of has that effect to then uh, go on to others. Um, uh, for instance, Gala, I'm sure some of your young students will be completely impressed and affected by your students and uh, we'll be reading about them for the next hundred years too. So I, I, I like to end um, on a positive note, like, like we all love happy endings in movies. Yeah. And I, I, I love, Harry, what you said about our five senses. You know? And I think that we sometimes forget to use all of our five senses in, in whatever we do in life, you know, whether it's uh, looking for the real or the unreal or just, just doing what we do. So I, I'd like to, you know, encourage us all to go back and, and utilize our five senses. And I'd like to ask both of you just to, to maybe say a last statement for our audience, which is um, aspiring artists, filmmakers, uh, performance actors, artists. Um, and what would you like to see? I'd like to see more of the five senses. What would you like to see? I mean, I, th I think generally it's just thinking about what it is. Okay, many of the, one of the possibilities that artwork can be for, and it seems like, uh, at least when I think about my own work is kind of making these props to under, to get to making knowledge, you know? So, we have all of these objects. What is the thing that I'm making is just a kind of like a visual aid. And that's not necessarily the final result. You know, here we have a solid object, but the actual work gets installed in somebody's mind. And so how to think through those things, I'd like to see how works can, how minds can be shaped through the things that we make more. Uh, Diverse ways, I guess, because you know I'm very straightforward maker maker, but I know that there's uh, so many even unthought of ways to do that yet. And um, I guess, uh, you know, we live in an era of virtuality um, that sits atop actuality. So uh, an actuality um, is something again that needs to be verified. So again, using the five senses, uh, I guess you need to touch, taste, uh, hear, feel, uh, see. Um, you cannot be reliant on only uh, one of your senses. Um, uh, and the idea is that uh, with all of this is it's, it's important to keep in mind that, um, uh, uh, you know, ideas uh, emerge, but um, you know, how do you actualize ideas? And by that, you have to make work. And, uh, and, and, and again, with the human body, uh, you become, you become. Uh, and, uh, and who are you to become uh, for yourself, but also uh, if we're in this field, who are you for others? And so, you know, it's important to understand that uh, as being a, uh, involved in this uh, uh, kind of position, we serve as role models. And so, um, because we will affect many people. And so the idea is, um, you know, what effect do we want to have on people? And, uh, and uh, you know, how do we bring a, a new generation forward uh, with a sense of uh, hope and positivity and a sense of humor, um, despite what might be occurring in the peripheral edges? Thank you both so much for your insights, for your wisdom, for your advice, for your 
for your contributions, your powerful contributions. Um, I wanna thank everyone that was attending um, for listening to our conversation today and for your contributions as well, your artistic contributions. Um, and I'd like to actually encourage everyone to participate in other Lalif events and screenings to, to look out for Harry because he will be there in person and he does have that star quality so it won't be hard to miss him. Thank you, thank you Gala, thank you Susanna, thank you Lalif. Thank you.